Hey everyone, so I understand Sue is a controversial figure. However, I personally learned a lot from him last cycle and I wanted to hear his takes on the current market. And if I'm doing that, then I might as well record a podcast, share it with the world, and anyone that wants to watch it can watch it. If you don't want to watch it, you don't have to watch it. No one's forcing you. Um, so I think I recorded a pretty honest conversation with Sue, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. What's up, everyone? Taiki here. Welcome to episode 17 of the Crypto Market Wizards podcast. Today, I have with me Sue Zhu. How are you doing today? Very good, and you? Good, good. Uh, so I don't think you need an intro, but can you just briefly tell us how you got into crypto and I guess your entire crypto journey, how you got here? Sure. Um, that's Bitcoin very early on, but um, from seeing it being used, uh, I heard about it when I was in Hong Kong and Macau, and then uh, didn't really trade it that much, just did some arbitrage. Uh, later on, um, learned about ETH ICO, didn't buy it, but was watching. That time was doing foreign exchange mainly, emerging market NDFs. And then by sort of <clears throat> early 2018, I decided to uh, stop doing FX and just fo focus entirely on uh, crypto. So that's when kind of the 3AC journey proper as a crypto fund began. And, uh, you know, we, we had a uh, pretty good run uh, over a few years, a uh, variety of strategies, uh, liquid and illiquid, um, alts and Bitcoin. So it was good fun. Yeah. So like what allowed you to, I guess, leave Forex to join or just go full or all in, in the crypto in 2018? Because I think 2018 wasn't a great time to get into crypto. Uh, so like, what did you see in the space back then that allowed you to just go all in? So I had kind of seen uh, the wealth creation, the rapid wealth creation in 2017. I had an equities trader who um, kind of blew up his equities book at my firm, but um, he was so busy trading ICOs and trading Ethereum that he was like, whatever. And so I saw that, I'm like, okay, the, the, there must be something more there that um, I need to focus on. Um, so in early 2018, actually, there was a, there was a firm in Hong Kong called uh, Census Markets. And um, actually, I think this is the first time this story's ever been told on a, on a podcast, but uh, there were uh, a few guys there that had just you know, quit their banking jobs to, to start a crypto market making firm, trading firm. And so we invested in that. Um, that was like outside of three hours at that time. And then later on, we kind of, uh, you know, that firm did quite well. Uh, we did quite well on, you know, basis strategies. Back then, there was a lot of contango, a lot of funding trades, mainly BitMEX, OKX. These two probably top two, Bitfinex. And then, um, you know, by the end of 2018, we decided, why don't we wrap it into three arrows and just stop doing FX altogether and focus entirely on crypto. So kind of ha had some help getting there uh, from, from bringing in new people. I think that's always important as well to, to make sure that you, you, you align yourself with talent whenever you can. So. Yeah. And how was the, I guess the last bull cycle? Uh, I remember, you know, you did the GPTC trade, um, you were just farming things during DeFi summer. Um, can you just tell us about your memorable trades, maybe biggest wins, biggest losses, and the biggest lessons that you, you took away from those trades? Maybe starting with Grayscale. Grayscale was a really good trade because at the time, actually, everyone thought the trade was already dead because it had been around for a few years. And really, Grayscale Ethereum was kind of how we made a lot of money really fast because at the time, 2019, people thought Ethereum was kind of dead anyways. Uh, it's a very high Bitcoin dominance environment. I think Ether versus Bitcoin was around the 0 0.018 to 0 0.03 range uh, at that, that time. Um, it had reached an 04 at, during the Constantinople hard fork. And then that was the one where they actually reduced POW issuance from three to two. And so everyone bought it thinking that, okay, now it's finally going to rally. And then it proceeded to have again versus Bitcoin. Very similar to the merge um, uh, price action wise. But anyway. So it was in the backdrop of very, very weak uh, demand for anything related to Ethereum. And so Grayscale had announced their Ethereum trust was, was going live. And, and um, you know, like GBDC was yielding around 25%, but you had to wait a year. So it was really, and it was a 2% management fee. So it was like, kind of like a 20% trade. Pe people did it, but no one did it on any kind of looping and no one did it kind of thinking they're going to hit the ball to the park. But then, uh, and a lot of people thought it was actually going to die at some point because you know it's gonna get arb zero or something but no one thought it'd go to discount people just thought eventually get arb zero um so they thought it was like a waste of capital now we decided to go really big on grayscale ethereum because we just thought okay well there's a nice convexity there because uh if 
in a year there's demand for Ethereum and no one has any, no one has these shares besides us, right? So then it's kind of a nice trade to have and you can kind of set your own price. So that ended up playing out really well um, where, you know, it was around 400% premium. It wasn't as high as 1,000% premium. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think in terms of realized premium, we probably realized around 300%. So it was kind of a quick way to, you know, 4X your Ether stack. Um, so, and that was really good. Uh, another, I guess, key thing we did starting to do then is that, you know, we realized that, well, Grayscale Ether, you know, there's people willing to lend against this because it is good collateral, right? Or, you know, reasonable collateral. So someone, if they're lending dollars, lending Ether, they can lend against it. So we realized that then we could, you know, do that trade while continuing to do other trades. So ha kind of having a multi-dimensional portfolio. And so I think we were really good at doing that multi-dimensional portfolio where the collateral is being used to then do farming. I mean, the, the, the collateral is in a, in a longer term trade while the, uh, you know, loans are then used to do other trades, right? So that was really good. I think that backdrop also allowed us to do like farming really well because when Compound for, first launched, actually also very similar to Athena this cycle where the dollar yields are like 500%. Uh, to begin with, later dropping down to 100%. But that was something where you wanted to basically double-sided farm die uh, on Compound when it launched. Farm on the highest leverage you can, basically, to to get the comp rewards. Because they were rewarding borrowing and lending, essentially. So you can just deposit it and withdraw the same asset repeatedly. Right? It's kind of a... It pumps up the TBL figures, but it's actually really absurd that you get paid for it. Um, yeah. But, you know, that was the environment of DeFi Summer. So... You know, we did that trade, uh, but the key, I think where we kind of did it really well versus other people is that we were like, well, you still need to keep the Ether exposure or the Bitcoin exposure, because if you don't have the exposure, you are then risking like Ether just doubles and then your yield is kind of pointless, right? So I think around that time, Ether was on 300 to 400 range. There were big sellers at 400 repeatedly at that time, some big funds. Um, and so... You know, we, we were, while we were farming 200%, we, we then bought like ETH futures, then ETH options, as well as Bitcoin options, basically to try to keep that upside exposure using the yield. And I think that that's a, that that's usually a good strategy when yields are very high, probably also means the market's going to pump because, you know, money that doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? If people are willing to pay you high funding, they, ha they like, they have to be making money at some point. If they're not making money, then, then it's going to be an implosion, like a massive one. So either it's going to be a massive implosion or everybody wins. That's typically the right way to think about it. So then if everyone's going to win on the long side too, you're simply getting a cut from financing it. So you might as well make sure you also eat the, you know, eat from both meals, I guess is the way to say it. So, so that we did well. Um, separate from all that, you know, we, we did venture. We, the first was really Deribit. And then we also bought a lot of SAFs um, under the basic premise that, you know, there was an unlock premium that was happening each time where, because 2018, end of 2018 was so brutal, most people thought these products would kind of die. So you could buy them. And on mainnet, they would already start pumping because they simply shipped and you could access a wider range of people uh, that would be part of that community. So, you know, Polkadot, Solana, Avalanche, Filecoin, there's a number, Definity, there was a number of these that, that we did in various sizes. Probably the most famous, one we're most famous for is probably Polkadot in 2020. Um, but, uh, you know, we did Solana as well and we did a few others. Um, and then I think 2020, 2021, we did some, you know, locked trades where, you know, you're buying AVAX locked and then, and then in an ecosystem fund, there was a uh, near Luna, Mina, a few of these other ones too, where it's kind of, you're buying at a pretty big discount and then, uh, you know, you're, you're locked for some period of time. So I think, um. I think it probably would have been wise to sell spot and then buy that round, but you know, we, we didn't really tend to do that. Um, actually, it would be curious what would have happened if we did, because maybe it would have been like not much of a pump, but then it would have been like a smoother ride in some of these coins, especially a near. Um, probably the most obvious one, but um, yeah, I think it was a I think it was a good uh, good mix of strategies, kind of opportunistic, also you know um, directional. So I think. That was kind of a that was kind of a backdrop where I think the the liquidity mismatch between the books um, you don't really think about as much in a bull market because uh, liquidity mismatches kind of get uh, shrugged away 
Like a good example of that is now with staked ether, right? Like there is actually still a liquidity mismatch between ether and staked ether. But in a bull market, you don't have to care so much because it's like, well, it trades at 99.5% maybe. But if you get a big systemic risk, then for a few days, you can possibly get a very, very big deep peg. So I think that, um, you know, liquidity mismatch was kind of where we earned a lot of money before. And then also where we kind of paid a high price, where a lot of the portfolio was stuck in a liquid stuff that everyone had the same positions. So pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember last cycle very vividly where I remember you doing the, the compound trade where no one really knew how to value these tokens. So as soon as they saw TVL go up, the token pumped. So when you were just lending and borrowing guy and just looping it, uh, it's very reflexive in the sense that, I mean, I did it for Matic as well, where, you know, I couldn't really afford eighth minute fees back then, but I just went to Polygon, cheap chain, and then you know, I taught people how to like lever loop farm. Uh, but I guess the question is, you know, they say history often repeats, but it often rhymes. Uh, what similarities do you think uh, you see this cycle to last cycle and how are things different? Do you think the market has matured more um, and how does it affect how you trade, I guess, the liquid and private markets? I think it's matured in some sense. And in other ways, I think the same games get obfuscated or reskinned rather. So I think a good example of that, I think, is lending. I think there's going to be a very weak OTC lending market, but it is starting to come back. I also think that, um, you know, with ETFs as collateral, that's going to be a lending market that that gets quite big at some point at banks. So potentially, you know, if there is a huge market collapse at some point, you know, banks might actually be in trouble because they have to liquidate ETFs very fast. But, um, you know, I think, I think DeFi side, people kind of understand that the pool two game doesn't work. So if you try to do that, no one will play it because they'll, they'll already, you know, do kind of an inductive thinking and say, okay, you know, or reverse, uh, induction from, from the future and say, okay, what is the last step? Okay. It's going to die. Okay. So then the next last step also going to die. So it's going to die right now. So, you know, that, that's why you haven't really seen like Olympus forks do well, or kind of, you know, pool two games do well. In general, these kind of crypto mechanism games are just reminding people that it's going to end at some point and smart money, you know, also wants to be where new money is, right? They want to be where meme coins are. So I think that's one way where I think the market has gotten more efficient, I guess you call it, and that they don't want to play those games, but then they're also playing other games where it's still obfuscated, right? Like when a, when a meme coin launch, you know, some of them are fair, but of course, a lot of them are also, you know, the team snipes the supply and then... There's a whole way that these are done. So I think that the game is always changing, right? But um, general mechanisms are, are quite similar. I think in terms of farming, I think Athena is a good example of a very high yield that happened because of basically locking, right? So, so when you stake in Athena, uh, when you stake uh, USDE, you're getting the perp yield, but you're foregoing the uh, shards, right? You're not getting as many shards. But you have liquidity too. Like you, you could in theory dump your SUSD in the market. And then when you lock USD, it's still seven days, but you can't sell it anymore. Uh, but you get a bunch of shards. So essentially, I think that's a cool design because it's like they're they're giving you circ supply, right? They're giving you circ supply upfront uh, to make sure that the TVL grows fast early and gets mind share. So it's a uh, it's very well done in that because the protocol is still undervalued or felt like it's undervalued, what you're getting doesn't need to dump necessarily. And then they make you restake it, right? Because if you have your ENA, you need your ENA to stake so that you get the bonus yield. So it's similar to Pendle, similar to like pretty much everything that curve, you know, that, that has had that model. Where these models break down is, is further along where that is no longer true that the coin is cheap enough that someone can buy it on its own. And then it becomes a mechanistic game where it's like, okay, let's force people to buy it who don't really want to buy it and then make them lose money. And then hopefully it's, it's going to be okay. But um, seems they're not quite there yet. But um, yeah. And then, and then obviously points is the big mechanism of this cycle. And I think it's actually too early to say still if points are going to work. Uh, I think they've definitely worked in some cases and not in others. Uh, I think that... Um, Naturally, if you really think about it, it's just the same as a pool two, except we don't let the pool two trade where, you know, people are farming, people are, let's say, doing something semi-irrational in a pool one to then get the new coin. And so the pool two game in the past was, well, 
the new coin you get, we're going to give you 10,000% APY versus either. So, so then that way, you're not going to always dump your pool, pool two coin. You might actually farm with it or buy more of it, right? And all that, you know, kind of dies when a few whales nuke pool two and then it's over because uh, the 10,000% APY doesn't account for, or it doesn't compensate when you go down 80% a day or something. So points is quite similar where points is like, okay, I'm giving you something. You, you don't know what it is or you don't know quite how much it's worth, but if it's optically high enough, then you might start doing some dumb stuff, hoping that, uh, hoping that when the points go live, then that's actually worth something. But it could be that, that everything you've done is, is, is pointless, right? It's a bit like if, you're, if your mom tells you, if you do your homework for five years, then at the end of the day, you know, you rack all these points and then at the end of five years, <laughs> she's like, well, knowledge, knowledge was your reward, right? You, you already got so much knowledge, you don't need any more reward. And then you might be like, huh, and then maybe, but you scam me, mom. Right. So, you know, that, that, that's something that, um, is just very obvious. So I think that's why, you know, a margin fi you see a bit of angst when they're like, where are my tokens? And then, you know, friend the, I think they did it really well where they just gave up the tokens, the, the VCs gave up the tokens. It's going to be a lot of populism though, because I think unlike with tokens where you, you do the tokens. Points is super centralized. They can just make shit up all day, right? They can next week say, we're going to dilute everyone who's been farming it. We're going to do tri triple bonus points for like two months. Now everyone who's doing it before then pulled, they're like super rug. Uh, or you could do like one year bonus. Or you could say like at the launch of the token, you say, okay, anyone who pulled before launch, they don't count. Like it's just completely made up, right? So that's good and bad, right? It's good in the sense that you have less like exploitation farming potentially. But it's bad in that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of pressure to, to uh, you know, if the points don't perform well, it, it's, it's just dead, right? Um, so, yeah. you know, Blast, we're kind of seeing that angst as well because, you know, it's people are now not sure if this stuff is worth anything. Um, they spend a lot of time farming it. Um, in a way, it's like a negative, it's a vicious cycle because as the community gets like more mad, new people are going to be like, you farm this just to dump on me. Why, why would I buy it, right? It's like, it seems ridiculous because the anger creates bad vibes, which creates more bad vibes. And then eventually people are just like, screw it. Yeah, it's like the, re re the reflexivity in vibes. Uh, it feels like you know, this cycle with points and like all these things, we're just rehypothecating the same system that we created last cycle. Um, but I guess now with points, the projects have more power. It's similar to how, you know, yeah, like with Blast, Pac-Man just keeps issuing more points. And now there's gold. And Pac-Man says, if you bridge out of Blast, you lose all your points. Um, and then we had Machi Big Brother lose, like, punt $5 million. Or he, he lost like $5 million or something in Apes. And then he got like a million dollars with a blur. And he's like, all right, like, fuck this. But he still keeps playing the game because I think maybe he has a gambling addiction or something yeah points i think is is one cool thing is that it's a bit like a loot box where you're like i'm not sure if i was rugged if i was unlucky or if it's better than luck next time whereas a pool two it's more obvious exactly what's happening like well whales are nuking or like there's not enough demand because you don't know what the demand for points is right now like no one knows what the demand for eigenlayer points really is no one knows that right it's 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 priced off let's say celestia or priced off something else but no one knows what that's worth. So that is structurally the problem. And like points are often valued off other points, right? So, you know, in, in the case of like re like restaking points, like those are like there's probably no genuine demand for it. They can only value it versus like other points. It's like EtherFi took token is live and and so that gives a it gives a comparable to value against, but it's very pyramidic in the sense that Everything is valuing off one thing, which itself is not very uh, liquid. So like the question is how many people are willing to buy it versus how many people are like willing like to do many irrational actions, hoping to get it. And that's exactly what GBDC is, right? Because GBDC is, you know, it's a relatively thinly traded stock at a premium to Bitcoin. And you're sitting there, you're saying, okay, how many people are going to do actions that they wouldn't normally do, like lock up their Bitcoin in a trust uh, to then uh, try to sell that to somebody, right? And then if you think about it, the ratio of people who put in to do that versus people willing to buy it at premium was like maybe 100 to 1 at some point, right? Um, in large part because neobank models, they got client Bitcoin and they said, okay, let's put it into a GBDC trade because what else are you going to do with it, right? There's no other yield. You're going to put it in Badger. You're going to put it in 
you know, Ave, like it's just not real yield, not good enough yield, right? So, you know, I think it's something where people are doing it because everyone else is doing it. And then everyone else is doing it, uh, makes it now seem like, okay, it's a launch pool that, that this coin that we all got together and, and made could make, could be worth something. And that actually, so pool two works in the beginning, right? Let's keep in mind, Wi-Fi worked. And that's why everything else then came like, and why I, and why if I too also worked. So it's something where it does work until it doesn't. So the, the first ones work and then the, the last ones don't. Uh, so the timing's everything. Yeah. And with all these pull to quote unquote Ponzi's, the cost to reproduce new ones are so low that if one thing works, then people just keep making new ones. Uh, and then it dilutes the bid because there's limited amount of capital in crypto. Um, and then, you know, yeah. then things start to collapse. Um, and speaking of a collapse, um, I do want to talk about one thing you mentioned earlier around implosions. Um, and, you know, you entered the ETH e trade during a high Bitcoin dominance um, regime uh, where ETH BTC was also hovering around 0 0.04. Uh, and, you know, right now, I think Bitcoin dominance is roughly around 57%, ETH BTC hitting new lows. Uh, where do you think we are in the cycle? Uh, do you think we're, I think in, in Steady Lads, we, in a different podcast we did, uh, you said, you know, like maybe we're in early 2020. Uh, do you still think that we're early to mid-cycle vibes or do you think that we're later on? I think it's still relatively early to mid-cycle. I think that, uh, you know, normies are starting to come now. Uh, and I also think that a lot of uh, family office money is getting quite interested in crypto, especially because they don't like the opportunities in TradFi as much. You know, commercial real estate is in trouble. Uh, there's a lot of issues in some emerging markets. And so I think that that, that will create a big bid over time. Uh, I think that retail will probably come a bit later in the cycle. They're coming, you know, actually the meme coin frenzy is still mainly natives playing meme coins. It's almost like NFT traders playing meme coins. And then, you know, uh, wealth effects from, from crypto natives, uh, trading meme coins. Cause if you even look at the type of meme coins being traded. Like you ask the man on the street, he doesn't know these memes. In fact, he'll be, he'll be shocked when you tell him what the M caps are. So, you know, the man on the street, uh, is not here yet to, to play meme coins, but he is starting to hear that meme coins are back. So I think that's kind of around, you know, cause people love analogies, but I think kind of analogies a little bit broken because you've already broken all time high before having, which hasn't happened before. So either it's like an acceleration and that means we're going to like also be a shorter cycle, like a left translated cycle, or it's going to be, um, something more like, uh, you know, fewer dips now. And then it's just like less supply. Right. So. Yeah. What do you think about cycle theory? Because, you know, obviously you came up with the super cycle. Um, and then because we hit all time highs worth having people are saying, oh, this is it be a shorter cycle, left translate cycle. Um, how do you think about, like, do you even use cycle theory when it comes to trading the majors and altcoins? Um, and yeah, like how, how does this affect your views? I think it's somewhat, I think it's somewhat useful, but I think that you have to also take each um, situation differently because, you know, each cycle you have random stuff happening that are kind of exogenous to the system, right? Like two cycles ago, it was Ethereum and smart contracts. So if you're trading Bitcoin on cycle theory, uh, you know, it's useful, but you're missing a lot of the point of that cycle, right? And this cycle really is a solano led cycle now if we really zoom out a lot. And, you know, it's actually dragged down by other stuff to a large extent. And then it's a Bitcoin ETF cycle as well. So, you know, I think that that is, um, cycle theory doesn't really account for that kind of stuff well. And I also think that, um, you know, there's a lot of fundamentals that are shifting on different chains. So I think, People probably would be better served by some kind of a broad time-based uh, analysis. I do think that toward the end of this year uh, is a is going to be an event you want to start selling into, um, because I think that um, the likelihood of you know next year in the spring uh, there being more volatility in all directions is gets higher and higher because I think actually. Right now we're in a low volatility regime still, like even with this weekend dump, it's still relatively low volatility on Bitcoin. Like we haven't seen a 25%, 30% dips in part because I think of the unit bias as well. Like when the numbers are very high, the volatility is decreasing in part because 
like a one thousand dollar move now now looks like a dip to buy, whereas that's like thirty dollars when it's three thousand. So you wouldn't buy a thirty dollar dip, but you might buy a thousand dollar dip, even though percentage wise it's like the same, right? So that's one cool thing about like a very very high unit price, which is that it just feels like you're buying dips, even though it's like in small percentages. Uh, that's one reason why I think Bitcoin's up for me either, actually, because Bitcoin like the dips. Like, you know, would you rather buy a $1,000 dip on Bitcoin or a $100 dip on Ether, right? Yeah. You're getting more dollars when you buy the Bitcoin dip. So you got, got to buy the bigger dip. So I think that's actually a big effect for normies, especially because, you know, it's, I think the Bitcoin price action now looks very logical to normies. They're like, this makes sense. ETFs got approved. Having is coming. Everything's just logical. And so that they're like, I totally get Bitcoin now. Before, maybe I thought it was a scam or I was confused, but now I just get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, you know, my, my, my partner or like my fiance, uh, she thinks she thought crypto was a scam last cycle. And now she's like, oh, yeah, like Bitcoin kind of makes sense. So I definitely agree with, um, I guess, your take on the normie mindset. Um, and speaking of big corrections, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, we're recording this on Monday the 15th, but we saw a huge wipe across the board when it comes to altcoins. So, Bitcoin and Ether didn't flinch that much, but you know, just general altcoins down anywhere from 20 to 80%. And I do want to share this post that I saw on Twitter. And I'm not trying to, you know, poke fun or anything, but we had this account where Crypto Nerd said, just woke up and that realized I got liquidated overnight. I was 3x long Pepe. I lost everything I had. Um, don't have much in the bank account, had a million dollars in Binance, lost everything, feels really bad. And fortunately, um, I think Binance has an 83% uh, liquidation ratio. So he still has 180K left and he's grateful uh, that he, get, he can run it up again. But as someone that, you know, ran it up huge and then, you know, just experienced huge drawdowns, um, how do you bounce back mentally from events like this? Um, and after, you know, or I, I guess, you know, people watching this, maybe they drew down 10 to 80%, depending on the, the type of altcoins they hold uh, or they held. Uh, you know, how, how, how do you bounce back after these, these wipes out, uh, these wipeouts? Do you just keep chugging along because you still believe in the cycle? Uh, yeah. Like how, how do you, mean, you, if you read the, if you, if you, if you read the, the market wizards, uh, the like track five version, pretty much all the big traders have had big blobs early in their career. It's just a matter of when it is and, and, and how it's done. So I think that, um, there's actually a pretty high correlation with uh, having blown up a few times and being uh, plus EV. It's a simple, it's simply a misestimation of how high the EV is relative to the risk of ruin. So risk of ruin is something that is harder to price on a daily basis because wh whenever the day doesn't, it doesn't happen, then you're like, oh, this doesn't matter, right? So I think that like know that it's part of your journey, I think, and also know that it's not a, it's not a big deal at the end of the day, right? Like, uh, if you think about like simply Jesse Livermore, he made a loss of billion like three times. Um, like it's not, it's not, it's not a big deal, right? You just do it 10 times if you want, you can do it, can do it hundred times. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, but the thing is like the key is to learn from each time and then make sure you, you, uh, you know, don't like get greedy and try to like win back your losses fast and like, re like regroup, uh, figure out what you did wrong, figure out if your process is wrong. You know, like I know traders where, you know, they'll have someone monitor their account. If it, if it draws down too much, they like lock them out. You know, that actually is, is a good practice. If you, if you find that that tilt is the main problem for you. Like I used to work at a prop trading firm in Singapore and, uh, you know, a sister firm nearby, like they would turn off your computer. If you drew down like $2,000, the computer would just shut down. The positions would get auto closed and then you'd be sent home. And it sounds stupid, but they, that, that's how you risk manage like a hundred traders in an arcade. You just say, look, I don't care what your reason is, but you lost money. So you're obviously not doing well that day. So go home, think about it and come back tomorrow. So, you know, obviously trading with that kind of a risk limit, uh, you, 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 uh, actually will have a lot more discipline because you'd be like, okay, am I actually trading the best setups? Do I know what I'm doing? Am I just gambling? Am I just speculating? So I think that, you know, if you're someone who takes a lot of positions, uh, and you don't quite size, size them properly to your risk, 
you know, having that kind of uh, drawdown experience is actually really useful for say, okay, what is your actual alpha? How do you harness and finesse that alpha and not, you know, let it creep into lo- all sorts of other things. I think that there's a tendency to treat trading as a, as a sport, which I think is, is the right way to think about it. Like, um, it's less so of a game, actually. I think to think of it as a game is actually a mistake because yes, it's a game, but if you believe it's just a game, you won't take it as seriously as you should. Whereas if you think of it as a sport, um, you know, think about it as something that you're continuously getting better or worse at, uh, based on what's happening that requires your mental focus as well. And it requires your physical focus. I think that, um, Making like a game implies that you can just lo- lose the game, press restart button and play again, right? Or you just like reload, like GG reload, but uh, re- or, re- or respawn. Whereas like you can't actually do that. So I think, um, you know, kind of balance it in a way that you can learn from mistakes. Uh, you can risk manage appropriately. I think that that's really important. But at the same time, like assuming you do end up blowing up, you know, a big account. Uh, I've known so many people in crypto who grind who grind back from like losing like 90 percent plus i i know at least 100 i think so that's part of the beauty of crypto which is that it just takes one or especially at smaller sizes it just takes one or two big ideas to make it all back and and actually you know it's like the hard times make tough men thing it's like you know having had that you're supposed to then you know grind the trenches i mean how many posts have we seen like last couple of months ago where it's like i lost it all in ftx everything went a liquid I couldn't get any access, but then I made it, I, I regained my FTX highs and more. And it's like, you know, maybe they're farming airdrops by following guys like you, or maybe they're, you know, doing other things, but like, there's just so many opportunities. It's actually kind of insane. And so I think that, you know, if you, if you focus more like, oh gosh, like, you know, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it again. I mean, it's, um, it's quite defeatist because you also know that other people have done it, right? Like. In, in fact, if you know how to do it once, it's much easier the second time because it's like a, think of it like, like a road that you've gone down and you've seen it and, and, you know, you come back again, like, you know, roughly how the road goes. May, maybe like there's branches, you know, that, that, that have fallen, trees that have fallen, but you know, roughly what it looks like to, 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 to do that. So, and think of it as like a, as like a challenge, right. At that point where it's like, okay, let's, uh, let's do it again. Yeah, I guess. You know, by learning through experience, you know, we have to have an innate belief in ourselves that we can do it because otherwise, you know, people that draw down, you just leave, but the people that stick around, they just keep grinding. Um, exactly. I mean, if you don't have that belief in yourself in the first place, you should not enter trading at all because that's not a, that's not something that suits you, right? Because you have to essentially, when you're trading as a market, you're saying the market is mispricing something. Uh, so I'm going to do an action. I'm going to risk capital that is trying to prove that the market is wrong right? Whether you're buying or selling. So if you don't have the, uh, the desire to wager your beliefs versus the common beliefs versus market beliefs, then you shouldn't even be putting yourself in a position to draw down. So if that's the case, when there's no shame in that as well, then, you know, you can just hold or you can just, you know, put in cold storage or you can have your friend hold, you know, in, in some kind of managed thing. And that's a common approach for a lot of people, right? Especially what I've noticed is that as people have, get, have more money, they become more humble because they've also seen more. So, you know, you, if you meet family office people, they'll be like, you know, they, they use a lot of advisors. They use a lot of like safeguards, maybe several levels of safeguards. It's because they know after seeing multiple generations and multiple things, they've just seen all the folly that humans can do if they have a lot of discretion, right? At the same time, this is never going to create wealth, right? Like that's also why second gen, third gen, it's very hard to create wealth. Because in this mentality, all you can do is preserve wealth. You can't really create wealth, right? So there, there is that kind of um, inherent, uh, uh, inherent contradiction in that to create great wealth, you have to take great risk. But to preserve great wealth, you have to take incredible, par- like you have to have incredible paranoia. Yeah, and I want to talk about this tweet uh, where I think last cycle you had this thing around linear wealth versus log wealth. Um, I guess, you know, to be more broad, uh, so, you know, to give you more room to talk about things, um, I often get this question whenever I interview, uh, guests for this podcast where, 
you know, if someone has, let's say, five figures, um, low to mid five figures, how do they get to like, let's say, let's say seven figures, you know, um, what kind of trades that they should like, or what kind of trades should people be looking into? Um, and how do people find these asymmetric risk reward trades uh, that can, you know, really, you know, give people an asymmetric sure. payout? Sure, sure. So at the five figures mark, you literally will just want to try every single project that anyone ever talks to you about. And you should try it, have a spreadsheet, stay organized, know like how to claim the airdrop, know the Discord links, know everything, and just do this. Last cycle, DYDX airdrop was worth half a million dollars, I think. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So if you just use that once. So I think that, you know, the, this cycle, for instance, if you, <clears throat> if you just bought Remilio's, and uh, spread them across wallets. Don't don't put them on one wallet. You're gonna start getting a lot of airdrops. Like the Athena you know one, you, you you get back almost all your principal, like in one go, right? So, I think that look for spots like that where you know you get rewarded, like in a non-linear way, kind of. Uh, and I mean, you're obviously an expert in in that space. Um, I think that I think that uh, other than that, you know, it's and so a lot of it is about like playing event driven, playing opportunistic, where again, you have an edge because you can come in and out and it's quite, quite okay liquidity for you. And whereas for other guys it's not, um, so whether that's like meme coin sniping launches or whether it's like, think about like a lot of meme coins, if you had strategies where you, you, you buy them once they reach a certain volume profile or like liquidity profile, you would have cashed with. You would have cashed Slurf. You, you would have cashed a bunch of these other ones, Bowdoin. Um, and if you're disciplined enough, like one of them pays for 100 losses, right? Or 50 losses. And even your losses are not going to be total losses. So I think that that kind of a, that kind of framework, like we'll look for convexity. You, you, have, you know that you're going to need convexity to make it 100x. So like anything which is less convex, you should try to avoid. So something that's like less convex is like, uh, like, like trading, like, Ether versus Bitcoin or Solana versus Ether or something like that. Like that's not convex. That's for the whales. So you leave that game for the whales. And for you, you figure out like the five to seven game, which is like, just takes like, you, you do higher DD than other people. You have some info edge that, okay, this is coming out, events coming out. You catch one coin pumping like three X on, you know, from going from a maybe 50 to 150 mark cap. That's pretty much all you need, right? Like last year, there were so many coins that went there. 30x even in bear market, right? Like Rollbit was like a 30x in a bear market. Uh, Flex was a 800x in a bear market. Obviously, liquid wise, maybe more like a 20x in a bear market. You know, Unibot. You know, so there, there's always those opportunities. Uh, you, you will definitely have to catch some of them in order to grow your account size. If you don't catch any of them and you're trading just majors, you, you know, it's your account's too small to to actually trade majors, in my opinion. And you're, you're actually very likely to get liquidated in doing so. And so you don't catch that natural convexity that crypto gives, which is that populism stuff where you can get one DYDX airdrop and make half a million dollars. All right. Think about Farcaster, another great example, uh, which I miss, unfortunately. But the DGen airdrop, I believe, is like $100,000 if you just you use it five times. Uh, and it's, again, it's an app where you're like, I'm not sure why I can expect Farcaster airdrop to give me 100K. But that's kind of the humility required to be a small scale, like, count trying to go big because it's like you will never know the reasons why for things you just know that okay people are talking about it potentially there's alpha i mean frantic is another great example right um i remember i was with frantic very early on by evan uh evan ss6 yeah. and i and i joined because of him and then you know frantic went through a phase in the middle where like no one used it and they were like okay frantic is dead bracer is a scammer blah 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 and then that's what they renounced like all, all the team points and the VC points now it's like resurgence it's coming back huge so it's like just don't don't overthink it like don't don't think you can predict deterministically exactly what happens in the future you you really can't but you want to put yourself in a position where you're doing things that if they worked and they made sense people could say oh, of course that makes sense but then you don't actually know that it will happen you can do maybe 10 of those things and most of them won't actually happen but the one that does it'll pay you a lot of money and the ones that didn't they don't even cost you money. Like if you sign up for these things, it doesn't cost you much money either. So, um, yeah, stay humble, basically. Yeah, I, I think this is why poker players do really well in crypto. Um, there's this element of pattern recognition. Um, it's like I, I have one analyst uh, that 
like farmed Jidosol across, I think like 10 wallets, spent like 15 minutes and he got like a 100K airdrop. I was like, oh my God, yeah. I, I was like coping so hard because I can't believe I missed the Jido airdrop. And then immediately after I saw that, I started to like stake Tia across a bunch of wallets um, because yes. I mean, I had no expectations, but I don't have to risk that much capital. I can just spread it across a bunch of wallets and just wait for things to come. Yeah. Um, and then I got like the dime airdrop, which was really big. Um, and, you know, obviously when you're doing these things, you, you don't really know if it's going to happen, but you want to put yourself in a position to succeed if you do get lucky. Um, and I think that's yeah. kind of the mentality you have to have when you're trying to run up a low, like, let's say five to six figure portfolio to a Yeah, seven. yeah, absolutely. The, there's a venture component, like the venture mentality too. Like if you ask venture guys, you know, they'll of course show you their bags, but they'll also say, look, I, I also know that most stuff will fail because that's the structure of venture in, in the first place. So they're actually extremely humble in that they don't say, I know this will for a fact succeed. And then ironically, you know, for a lot of like uh, higher leverage perps traders, they'll be like, I just know Bitcoin is going to pump. Like, like I know it. Or I know that Ether is going to dump. Right. And then so that, that, that element of humility is very much needed for um, convex like uh, exposure. Because to be able to have convexity in your portfolio like that, you have to, uh, like, ironically, it takes more humility to hold a coin for 100x than to just sell it for 5 or 10x. Because if you are very certain that you're like, okay, I know it's top because of these reasons and then do it. Whereas if you're humble, you might say, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I've already been up on this coin. I don't know why it will keep pumping, but I'm humble. I'm already in the trade and uh, I have no reason to, let's say, you know, I, you know, let the market do its work kind of thing. And so, because the problem with like over certainty in those aspects too, is that you'll inevitably fall bias to psychology. You will basically be like looking for reasons to do something. And the, the, power, the thing about the market is that whatever you look for reasons to do something, you always find them. You can look for reasons to either take off or add or close. You can always find those reasons. So if you already have an implicit bias of what you want to do, then overvaluing reason versus let's, let's say a, a more stoic venture-like process is, uh, is really important. Uh, like that example that you gave, right? It's like, it takes very little time, but it takes humility to do so. Because if, you, if it was a waste of time, you'd be like, I wasted all, all my time splitting across 100 wallets. I'm an idiot. But if you're humble, you're like, whatever. Probably waste of time. Maybe it's not. Just who cares? Just do it. And so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's li that's literally the expectation I had. I was, I was like, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to do it. I, I saw a lot of arrogant traders last cycle where they're you know, mainly trading perps on BitMEX or OKX. And when DeFi started out, they're like, what is this DeFi shit? It's so small. Like, call me when it's like big. And then they're like, wait a second, you guys all made 100x, right? So yeah. And so that, that happens every cycle. Like whatever you think you're doing is like more important. You know it better. It's a better game. It's, it's all these things. Prop. Pro like probably the small guy that's starting to do it, he's gonna he's gonna mock you quite hard this cycle. It's just uh, quite guaranteed. Yeah, because I guess for something to go 100x, it has to be so out of consensus. Because if everyone thinks it's yes. good, then exactly. chances are people own it and it's already up a lot. But if everyone thinks it's a piece of shit, <laughs> it's it's like in the shitters. Exactly. exactly. Like Ox is a great example right now because like you know G Sierra bought it, and then I see some chats like, did he really buy it? Why, why would he buy it? It's like. But it's like the fact that you don't almost don't believe that he bought, it, even though he like very clearly doxed it to buy it, just just proves that like why he's he's much better than you, right? Which is that he can buy it before his consensus and then sell it to you once you all believe it. So it's like that, like that element of uh, of of the few versus the many is ubiquitous in crypto, where ultimately the few buy from the many and the few sell to the many because of math, right? Like there's this notion people have like that. Everyone can sell the Dogecoin 69 cent pump, like top. Actually, only a couple of people can sell it. Everyone else has to buy it for that pump to be the top. And then the bottom is the same. For that to be the bottom, many people have to sell it. Only a few can buy it, right? So you want to put yourself in a, in a position where relatively few people are doing something. And then when you sell, you sell to the many. And then when you find yourself doing things that everyone is doing, uh, know that that has negative alpha because you are likely providing liquidity for someone who did the same thing as you, but just way earlier than you, right? So that that few versus many is a is a thing you have to always think about. Like, like 
great example is like if you buy ETH into the merge, like you are now very much part of the many. The people who like bought ETH like six months before the merge, uh, they're going to sell them to you because they did everything the same as you, except that they did it be before you, right? So you, you don't want to give that kind of like uh, time edge to people. You want to be in the time edge. Uh, you want to be on the razor's blade of the time edge. Um, yeah. And that makes all the difference. Timing is everything. So, yeah. And it, I think we, and I, th I think this is why I think the markets are becoming more efficient because I think Lido topped two months before Chappella. And I think L2 tokens topped, L2 tokens topped a month or two before EIP 4844. So people buy in anticipation of the event. And if you're buying because, oh, EIP 4844 is happening in two weeks, you know, people are going to buy my bags, then you are the exit liquidity. So you do have to, predict these narratives and rotations because absolutely a great analogy to track my markets is like index rebalance right so in the early days of index re rebalance so index rebalance is like you know s p 500 or msci global or FTSE, where you know there's like 100 stocks in a basket right and based on some criteria as companies do well they get added to the basket they get added to the index when that happens you know there's a set you know criteria list some public some not so that they can't exploit it companies can't exploit it but basically you know, they'll, they'll have a, a announcement and then they'll say, okay, in 60 days, we will add this stock. And then you look at the performance of these stocks going into the, 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 uh, uh, we call it the addition date. So there's like announcement date, addition date, right? And this is one of the biggest data arb trades in the world for, for many, many years. It still is, uh, where people are saying, well, how do you trade stocks that are about to go into this big index? Right. And in the early days, like these stocks just all moon into the index, like going into the addition date. And then they moon even after the addition date because now it's like part of the best continual flows. Um, later on, people started to predict what stocks will go into the index. Okay. Uh, and then the edge started to taper off. And then on the, on the addition date, the, the price will dump a lot because like that date, everyone wants to sell that date. So then they sell. Uh, and so then, you know, banks sort of get smarter and they say, you know what, I'm going to actually just try to own the flow. I'm going to try to find the flow. So they go to the guys who have to buy the addition date addition and they say, how about I guarantee you to sell the addition date price? And then they essentially have a, a, a guaranteed sell order of the price on that day. And then they then trade it around to, to buy into it. So then the impacts went even less because uh, you know, they have the flow. They actually know what they'll do with it. So for instance, if you, if you buy the entire market's uh, addition day buy flow, then that means that no one will buy it unless you buy it. Do you see what I mean? Because you mm -hmm. guaranteed to sell to them on that print. So in, in other words, there's, the, the, there will be no one in the market buying because they need to. You have controlled all of it. So in that particular case, you know, market can actually nuke huge on the addition date, which would be, Completely really fine for your client as well, who who sold you the who, who who wants to buy the print from you at that flow because he gets a lower price, but it completely screws over everyone trying to play the addition game because they're they're hoping for the buy to come, but it never comes. So I remember there was this Vietnam stock where you know a bunch of devs were positioning for a pump on it, and it was going limit up like twelve days in a row, and then what uh what the manager of the fund of the index fund did was they went to the team, like they went to the founder of the stock and they said, how would I just buy it from you at a discount, like on, on some kind of a corporate derivative window. So then on that day, there was no buy flow. And then it would limit down 20 days in a row after that, uh, because everyone is hoping for the buy to come. And not only did it not come, but it was actually the, the, the flow had already been cleared. Right. So that is exactly very, very similar to, uh, that similar, similar effect in crypto where it's like, it used to be that on the Ethereum hard fork day, that is the day you have to sell because Constantinople pr proved it. A few other forks below it proved it. You, because there, there's no buyer after the fork. Everyone who thinks that the upgrade is bullish has to buy before that happens, thinking that they will sell either that day or after it. So think about what you would have to believe to be a buyer after that day, right? You'd have to see it pump through, but then who will buy it? Like you're, like you're waiting for the pump to then buy it because you didn't buy it before. So you must like, and then... That, that, that like psychology dynamic is, uh, is, is, is everywhere in finance. So now it's like an ultra front running where, like you said, two months before or three months before and unlocks are a great example where, you, you know, maybe before they want to see, wait, is this a bullish unlock or not? But now teams are getting smarter. So like say is a great example where they're not even waiting for the unlock. They're just trying to sell OTC, right? And then they're trying to dump it out. So at that point, it's like 
the team can front run their own unlock by trying to sell to people before the unlock. So there's like a front running of the front running. Um, so yeah, that's actually more getting more efficient, right? Because now you don't need that volatility of like first it goes up, then it goes down. Then it's just like flat. Uh, so, but of course the mechanisms where it does so, it's always intriguing. Like how does it, how like in, in theory, the unlock should, if it's perfectly priced, it should have no impact, right? Because it's just known. Mm -hmm. So the price should be completely flat, right? In practice, you know, people are like, okay, is it bullish unlock? Or, you know, maybe there's like new money coming in or something, or maybe, and then like, oh shit, it's not. And then it goes down. Um, that actually is pointless. It should just be like this, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think last cycle, it was, or for me, it felt like it was pretty easy to trade in narratives. Uh, you just see something on Twitter in the timeline. It's like, oh, yeah, let me buy that. And it just like keeps pumping. Maybe that was the byproduct of just there being so much retail money in crypto. Um, it feels like the capital base in crypto isn't really growing. Even you mentioned earlier, the meme coins. It seems like crypto natives are just bidding, you know, these memes. And the average normie doesn't really know anything about it. Uh, and even Rollbit, right? You, you gave that example. Uh, that rotation lasted three to six months before it's just retracing. Um, I mean, it's still up a lot, but you know, it really hasn't pumped, continued to pump like a lot of people uh, may have led you to believe. Uh, so first of all, when, like, how do you predict these narratives ahead of time? Uh, I think some people on Twitter have uh, expressed concern around, it seems like a lot of the price discovery is happening in the private markets and not the public markets. And it's really, really hard to trade the liquid markets right now. Uh, so how has your views on, yeah, like, first of all, like, how do you predict these narratives? Um, and how do you think about liquid versus private? I mean, predicting narratives, you need to do your research, right? Like you, you need to know what people are working on, what kind of narratives have funding behind them, what, what kind of narratives, uh, could make sense and expand. Uh, the narrative expansion range of things is important. So mm -hmm. I, I think that it's an art, not a science, but, um. I think that, you know, like, I think a quite obvious one that like a way to think about it is, okay, as it goes up, will more people believe in it or not? If yes, then that can expand. If not, then, right. then not. So I think on the public versus private, I mean, I think public markets are a little overvalued, but I think it's overly stated by VCs. I think the problem is that deal flow is very tight contested. So. What's happening now is also that founders are getting more efficient. Founders are smarter. Um, you know, last cycle, uh, we as well as, you know, Alameda and, and others, we would never negotiate valuation with founders because we, we took the general view that it's all mispriced, actually, because, uh, you know, it, the FTVs were, were, were too low. And I think that's been borne out by the results, too. Like, even stuff that, like, Starkware, like, everyone made fun of, but the FTV still opens much higher than the than the price right so i think that mm -hmm. like for good deal flow there's still a lot of opportunities it's the people who don't have any deal flow now or it's hard to get listed on exchanges and then maybe coins get relocked by teams i think that the pie the way that the pie is eaten is changing so i think for second third tier funds it's not great because they can't get tier one deal, deal flow uh plus you know let's say they do 10 let's say they make 10 bets eight don't do that well one does well, but maybe you know, the exchange requires relocking of investor tokens for another two years or something. Then you're kind of like the last to eat, right? You're kind of the, 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 the passive money bags guy that you know, the exchange will eat before you, the team will eat before you via their ecosystem allocation, retail will eat before you. You're like, you basically have to make sure that it really works to, to actually finally get to eat. So I think that's why there's a lot of angst on like private market valuation. But I think if you just look at the facts, it's still like, and it's, a, and it's a number of games too, right? Like one Athena pays for a hundred losses. So maybe 50 losses. So absolute losses. And, and so um, it's very not deterministic. Like your, your view on how venture is depends on whether you did five or six deals or not. And that's the same last cycle too, right? Because now we only, you know, we, we see the saloon of access, but there were lots of layer ones that didn't pump. I mean, I, I can name at least 15 that you probably haven't heard of that. Uh, or maybe you have, but the audience has not heard of that. We're hyped at some point in 2018, like Thunder. I don't know. Like, there's, a, there's just a lot of these, right? So, um, I actually think for most people, it doesn't make sense to compare public versus private because they don't have, they don't have that as a decision point, anyways. I think maybe for some funds, there's that decision point, 
like liquid funds. But again, it's like, you know, uh, think about ICOs, think about coin lists, right? The stuff that you could have bought on coin list, almost all of it did stupidly well. And the only problem is that the allocation is too small, right? If you bought Flow, right. I think it was like a 500X, can't remember. Like it was a known strategy that you just like get all your friends to KYC on coin list and then just buy every launch, right? And max size. It's free mm -hmm. money basically uh, because they're just, they're, they're, they're hoping that this is a community distribution. So I think, I, I don't know if you consider that public or private market, I guess, and maybe that's more like pre, like pre listing kind of dynamic, but in general, there is a huge alpha in buying before the exchange liquidity, because there's a whole set of people who buy new coins when they come out as a Pascal's wager. So if you can produce a new coin that can get to the platform that that's on, that'll create that new inflow. Same as an index rebalance. They don't care what it is. They, they're just like, okay, a new coin, I buy it, gamble it, I try it. Mm -hmm. So that public private gap will always be there because of those flows. And also because public people prefer wealth. I mean, the, the private people, they prefer wealth. They will not, no one likes to do, like do a project, do everything. And then like, let's just like price it and design it so that the people who just bought it will lose money. Like that would never happen, right? Like, so they, they're going to change all the numbers so, so that at least investors are up on paper. Um, then once they're up on paper is the question is, can they actually get out? Um, probably not in many cases, but if they solve SAFs, maybe they can. If they hedge with perps, maybe they can. So they, they you know, they'll let investors go to the wild and, and, you know, leave that up to the winds, but they still structurally have an edge because they are in before liquidity event. Um, I think that public markets are, they have good opportunities, but it's again, it's very extreme distribution. Like many, many alts are now down in the year. Uh, many stuff that was hyped has not gone up at all. Uh, so depends on what you're good at, I guess. Yeah, definitely. It definitely feels harder, um, at least in the public markets. And now I, I want to pivot the conversation to more psychological, because I think you're known for those cryptic tweets, uh, that is very thought provoking. Um, but I'll first start with this question. Um, I think when I've interviewed people, um, on my channel, uh, a lot of people said that, you know, people looked up to you or looked up to you last cycle. Um, and because you demonstrated that it is possible to make it, uh, like running a fund or starting from a small base capital and just like running it up huge. Um, but I want to, I'm curious, who are your investing heroes? Who have you learned from? Um, and what are some, I guess, lessons from the top traders that, you know, you took away from, uh, and apply to your own trading? I think Soros is a big one. He emphasized that you have to have a 3D thinking model, like a 3D portfolio, a 3D model of, of how markets are behaving. Uh, and so he talks about how, you know, that they'll have a foreign exchange overlay on top of an equities position, on top of a commodities position. Um, that was very impactful. And also his thoughts on reflexivity about how many times, uh, you know, Nothing is bullish or bearish, but thinking makes it so is, is something that I think is really, really like, like, and then, and, and smartest money he always talks about how price leads narrative, right? So the notion that the notion that like, uh, people collectively believe a narrative and then the price moves once they believe it is completely unfactual, completely fictitious of a concept. It's more that after the price moves, we then search grasp at narratives to explain it. And that's in the structure of the human mind because um, the mind is actually incapable of forming a narrative without a stimulus. Stimulus would response, right? So if we see something happen, then we try to explain what happened. We try to rationalize that. Uh, if nothing happened, there's nothing to rationalize. So knowing that, uh, then there's opportunities to create the narrative, right? So that, that's why, you know, after the ETH whales buy the ETH, then they say, okay, well, here's, got, here's why you need to buy it because the merge is coming. Right. And they're like, aha, uh -huh, the merge is coming. And then it's popping into the merge. And then after the merge, like, okay, that was cool. Uh, so, but crypto is filled with that. Traditional markets filled with that. Uh, the, 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 there are so many examples from 2017, 18, where like, you know, like the Zcash, I don't know if you were that around much then, but like, you know, remember, uh, there were, the, there's a Zcash fork. There's a high hybrid fork that somebody got named Rhett. Uh, or basically he, he was in an airdrop to Bitcoin and Zcash called Z Classic. He's going to fork out the team allocation. But this thing did like this thing did really well up until the day of the thing, up until the day of the fork. And then on the day of like, it just completely died. Like 
d- died in about two days, like down like 90%. It was very, very hype. Um, so reflexivity matters a lot. Think about how you create that kind of, um, and that's more from the point of view of like, uh, as a creator of narrative, I think, I think another great influence, probably Paul Tudor Jones. Like I watched his trader doc- documentary quite a bit in the other days and that helped a lot. And he has the concept of like, um, you have to bring high energy to whatever you do. Like you, you have to treat it like a sport. So there was like, they would show him like trading at like 3 AM, like currencies on the phone. Uh, they would show him like, you know, really analyzing the charts very like athletically, like being like, okay, this, that, this, that. I think that's actually important. So if you're uh, if you're like a directional trader, you have to be actually relatively um, engaged, right? With your so that means like trying to stay fit. That means like treating it like a sport. That means you know uh, being pup like a pugnacious person almost. I think that that's required. Um, so I think I think that those are probably my biggest influences, but there's so many. I mean, I read all the Market Wizard books actually before I started Three Arrows, and that was actually one of my biggest reasons why I started the fund because I, I just thought, you know, it's actually not that hard. You just kind of do it and you see how it goes and you don't know. But uh, if you believe in yourself, uh, Market presents infinite opportunities. So, yeah, you just have to stay in the game. And yeah, I mean, I, I read all the Market Wizards as well. And that's why I started this podcast uh, because I, t- I learned a lot reading those interviews. And I'm like, okay, let, let me just interview people in crypto that I respect and, you know, see, I mean, and I, I, I selfishly do this because I want to learn and then I might as well just share with the audience as well. Um, you know, there's actually a guy, uh, there's a guy named a- Anthony Lewis at Tomasic and he actually wrote, like, like he interviewed myself, SVF, I think CMS Holdings, a bunch of other guys. This was like early 2021, but he interviewed like all the like top crypto traders for a while and, he, and like for like three, three, four days each. And he wrote this like, huge text up but he didn't publish it because then like all the like a lot a lot of the you know the wizards are not so wizardish right but um <laughs> yeah, yeah you know like <laughs> like if you if you if you have if, if you have emotional interest in like creating that book like you can probably i i, I can probably connect to you and then like you, you can get those materials uh because i think that i think that there is an element of like okay even spf was a like was a criminal and daily stuff. Was he a market wizard? I think certainly he was a wizard of some kind, right? And to yeah. get that stuff written down and like seen and, and read, if only to be able to identify it happening again next time um, is, is very, very uh, cool. Okay, so while we're on this topic, um, what do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make in crypto, whether it be psychological, risk management? Um, yeah, can you just share? The I think mistakes? they compare it too much to other people. I think they, they benchmark too much to their near peers. And that's a mistake that mid curvers do a lot. So <laughs> when, they're in, when they're in a certain peer group, they're like, I want to be better than my peer. So, you know, I, I want a girlfriend that's harder than his girlfriend. Maybe like I want a car that's better than his car. And I want like, if he bought ETH, I'll buy like maybe 1.2X long so that I make more than him. I mean, you see it now in the Kyle suit battle ball. Like it's like, he's looking at what I'm doing and then be like, okay, then I need to do something different. Like actually he can just trade his own book, right? Without caring about what I'm doing. But because he wants to beat me, or you, you want to beat like your friend. Now you're not optimizing your own wealth. You're simply just trying to like stay ahead of some curve. And that is like really dangerous thinking actually, because the real goal should be self mastery and mastery of content and mastery of the thing itself, uh, for its own sake. Uh, and as soon as you evolve toward that mentality, then you unlock true potential because it could be that your friends are all idiots. So you're going to like outperform them and you're going to make like $20,000, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Conversely, like you could be the best of your group and then they, you know, copy a lot of what you do, but you learn nothing from them because you're just feeling like, you know, I'm the smartest guy here, here, I'll teach you about this, but you're not learning anything from them. Um, So I'm a big believer in that you are the people you talk to in crypto. Uh, So make sure that, it's as little about wealth flexing and about like, like positions as possible and more about primitives, more about talking about what is going to, like, what are coins? What are new technologies? What is like BRC20? Like, what is an airdrop, right? Like these kind of things will, will bring you into a much more, I mean, it, it, it'll at first feel like it's a waste of time. It'll be like, 
you know, what coin did he, you know, what coin did he buy? At what price can I do it too? But over time, you'll, you'll realize that you, you can reach a level of mastery that allows you to pattern recognize, as you said, and also to understand at a deep level, why coins move. Like, you know, like I had that tweet, which is like, you know, um, all PTC, like, you know, I think in my bottom and then the guy at the conference was like, you're joking, right? Like whales decide what it bought. It's not like, not, not guys like us. And, and so it's like, it's something where crypto is powerful in that if you tweet good stuff, like whales will DM you and ask you why you think that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's kind of like this MMORPG where like, you know, like whales surface and they're like, they'll, they'll message the, the smaller fish and be like, Hey, show me a coin or like, talk, like, Tell me why you think like the having is is going to be bearish or bullish. Like that is the power of crypto. And then, so make sure that the people you discuss things with are as intellectually honest as possible. Basically, yeah. I don't don't want. I mean, crypto Twitter like CT is very toxic, uh, but I do like the fact that it's more of a meritocracy where it doesn't matter what your background is as long as you tweet and post good ideas and you do it for a long enough time people will recognize you. Uh, how do you utilize crypto Twitter? Do you think it's mostly just noise? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's not that toxic actually either. And uh, I think the way to think about it is like, it's just like a frat, right? It's like a hazing ritual. Yeah. So you got like, you know, uh, I think for people from different cultures or maybe they don't like understand internet culture, they, they think of it as like, wow, this is like a cesspool of like, you know, uh, this or that, but I don't think that's true. Like, I think that 95% of people on CT, they're genuinely trying to learn and they're trying to share thoughts. They're trying to show you their bags, but they're also try, try, trying to learn which bags to buy. And I think that in almost all cases, like reading CT selectively, unselectively, it will make you a better trader. Um, the problem comes when people start to use it for uh, too much socializing and not enough like actual knowledge harvesting. I think that when it goes more into socializing, then you have to make sure that you are getting uh, out of it something that is improving your trading and investing. And especially in bear markets, this is extremely important because you don't want to be one of the many, right? Like if, if you're part of the many instead of the few, then you can just read CT and get fun out of your bag. You like withdraw from Binance, go max short BNB, and you're like, okay. FTX collapse, now Binance. Because that was a common view, by the way, in early 2023. Very, very common view. No one dares talk about it now. People all pretend that they didn't have that view or it didn't happen, but like it did. It, it was a thing that happened and it was mainly a CT narrative, actually. Because if you ask normies, I don't know a single normie that thought Binance was going down. Yeah. Like not one. Because you just ask him, people like, where, like, where would I go? You're telling me to go where now? Like he'll mm -hmm. look at you like you're an idiot, right? So. <laughs> So like, just, it's a good way to, uh, like a good uh, trick is to ask yourself, what are normies thinking right now? Like wake up, say like Normelio, what are the normies thinking? If that happens, uh, like do normies care? If the answer is no, then you're, then you may be in like a, a bit of like a whirlpool, like narrative. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes coins, I've seen a lot of coins overly cater to CT at a huge detriment when they could have just gone with a more mainstream narrative. Like last cycle, there's coins that went 1,000x that you never heard of on a CT, right? There's coins that did extremely well that very rarely get discussed in that context. So um, especially coins on BSC, uh, but coins on many exchanges really. Um, so there is a possibility of like all becoming poor together. If you discuss with a lot of people and then there's a collective desire for, for poverty. That actually happens very frequently on CT. But I think it's a, it's a net, it's a net, uh, useful way for you to meet people for, for you to like build up a brand, build up like how you think and, and share that. Like all the best ops we, we got were from Twitter, right? Like we basically, I mean, I started from a 800 follower at 800 followers in end of 2018. So, um, I remember I went to the Hobby event in December, 2018. That was right before they shut their office after just, just having uh, spent three million to renovate it because of the bear market. And, uh, I said to the guy, Hey, follow my Twitter. I'm trying to build it up. I have 800 followers. So when we have 800, then each person I met, I was just like, follow my, 
Twitter because that's like one like plus one each time, right? It's like yeah, yeah. Uh, and these guys just thought I was insane. They're like, why are you like, why are you asking me to follow your Twitter? But you know, by I think by mid 2019, I had maybe six thousand followers, and that was like eight x growth. And then for a while, there was this meme of like, will my follower account grow faster or slower than Bitcoin? And then at some point, your follower account just like moves, right? Because you're, you're so on and so forth. So I think, um, put out your true ideas, grind it. Like, don't, don't, don't treat it as like a, as like a sprint. It's a marathon. Life is a marathon. Uh, so like, what, like, while it's true that, um, CD is toxic, like you can also just mute people, right? Like, and don't and don't block them because maybe one day you like want to like listen to them, but if you block them, maybe they reblock you. They get to DM them. It's like I made the mistake of blocking too many people at one point, and then when I had to like get into GCs like group chats on on Twitter, like six people had to like unblock, re reblock, unblock, and it's just a bit of a hassle. So I recommend just just muting if you don't like someone, just mute them. Later, if you get added to a chat with them, then you can just unmute. You know, no one ever knows. So yeah. Then the, the next question I have is, what are some biggest misconceptions about the crypto market that you see people talk about? Um, yeah, biggest misconceptions. The biggest misconception is that the goal of crypto uh, trading is something other than so, so, uh, something other than uh, very doable and very uh, simple. I think that people overcomplicate it a lot, and they also try too many different strategies find what your edges find what suits your personality and just do it that is how you make a lot of money uh trying to do what everyone does like in terms of like oh that guy did this i, I wish i did that that guy you know that would never get you anywhere because you don't even if you can copy that specific specific trade you can't copy the way he thinks about it unless he lets you invest in him or something so um keep it simple if you're a long cycle trader you can just like trade every month or so do a rebalance that's probably enough, um, you know, and then you'll miss a lot of intermediate moves, but you don't care because that's, you know, that's what you're focused on. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the thing is he who chases two rabbits catches none. It's like the master yeah. of none. Yeah. Jack of all trades, master of none. Um, exactly. You know, you, you just have exactly. to understand your own personality, right? Uh, a lot of people, maybe they're not cut out for altcoins uh, or just certain types of trading. So maybe they're better off airdrop farming or just DCing, uh, which is not that exciting um, if you think about the, t the types of trades people flaunt on crypto Twitter. But you just have to be self-aware and understand what it, what is my edge and like what is your edge? Do you think is it crafting narratives, the the balls to you know go max long and weather the volatility? Uh, yeah, but what, like what is your edge? Do you think? I think at its core is like talent. I think I'm very good at identifying talent. So last cycle, actually, most of the best ideas are not even, let's say, originally my ideas, just that I, I hear about it, uh, we discuss it, and then we do it together. Uh, that was true for DeFi and, you know, Arthur Chong really kind of, you know, Arthur Chong and Andrew Kong kind of really brought me into DeFi um, with synthetics and then later on with Wi-Fi. And, uh, you know, with Grayscale as well, you know, we, we were also kind of, you know, we did the trade uh, like in the right sizing, but the idea generation comes from other people. I'm a big believer in young people because I think that in general, if there's a room of people, the youngest one probably actually is the highest alpha. And that's quite different from like in traditional markets where the oldest guy maybe is the highest alpha. So you want to listen to the elder and everyone else doesn't speak. In crypto, like you want to find the youngest guy who's in the game and be like, what coins are you buying? Like, why are you buying them? What's the narrative? What, what are you watching? Like that is how... Uh, you know, and that's the same with Web2, right? Like a, a lot of Web2 pieces that I speak with, they're like, you know, they'll ask 16 year olds, what are you doing on your phone every day? What are you like, what apps are you watching? And the answers will shock you quite a, you know, you know, quite a few times. So I think um, that's always been my edge, like being very open minded, uh, being very willing to listen to all, you know, all forms of knowledge, generally believing in this kind of few versus many, right? In, in the beginning, very few people will understand, let's say the chain link. And they'll maybe see a call and be like, this is a, this is a scam. And they'll maybe they'll do like a Zeus capital. Here's my short thesis. Right. Or, yeah, yeah. you know, but, but that is where the opportunities are. I think, um, and that's something that I've always believed in, in part, because I think I'm a big believer in the, in the outsider who, who creates value as opposed to like, it's made from within consensus and institutions. Um, the average normie, he believes that innovation comes from within institutions, right. Or from within the establishment. 
Whereas most crypto people, especially early crypto people, they believe that it's the opposite. They believe that all innovation comes from outside the institutions and eventually becomes institutionalized, right? So that's been my, probably my biggest edge, really, just that having that framework of thinking about how money is made, how, how knowledge transmits through, you know, pe people across time. Yeah. I think betting on young people makes sense. Uh, I, I, I hired someone recently and he's like a college student and I asked him like what you're doing and he's literally running incentivized test nets where, you know, he nice. pays like $10 a month running these nodes and then he you know, once in a while, he gets like a 10K airdrop and he's like, oh my God, like this is life changing money. Uh, so maybe it's the fact that when like younger people have less money, so they have a drive to look yes. for these asymmetric opportunities. Um, and then maybe, you know, the older people, they don't have that drive anymore. So they're just stuck holding like the majors and like boomer coins. Whereas the younger people, they're always looking for, you know, things outside the box. Um, and yeah, you have to be open minded because I think you know, cycle after cycle, I think the second cyclers, the third cyclers, fourth cyclers, they get more jaded and more cynical about the space. But it is that perpetual optimism that allows you to, you know, buy this shit that everyone hates. But it's like, what if, right? It's like the whole what if meme with Alex Weiss, like, what if this happens? And then just dream bigger. Uh, also, the, the, yeah. there's a tendency, especially if you, if you become like crypto old money, you become starting to think like, well, like, whatever was cool in your day, that was like the definitive, what was like going on and everything else now, like, I don't really pay attention. I don't really care. And so, you know, like I have some friends like from the 2013 era and they're still talking about like stuff that happened then, like, you know, stuff that would like, there are probably fewer than a thousand people in the world that would understand it, but they like still think about that kind of stuff. Um, like that is something where no one remembers what happened in 2016. No one, like how many people who bought, who buy Ethereum today even know that it had a, uh, like a hard fork or even know what a hard fork is actually. Yeah. I would say under a 5%. Um, so the, not only is the average IQ getting lower, but also mm -hmm. the ability to, uh, analyze that history is getting lower. So that presents a huge amount of opportunities actually, because it means that, uh, if you're older gen, you have a weakness in the markets because for instance, you may think, well, my bags are the best bags. Young people will come, they'll grow up, they'll earn income and they'll pay me money. They'll pay me rent. <laughs> I, I am like the rentier layer and everyone else, else will have to, they'll work a thousand years to, you know, let's say we solve longevity. Uh, like a young boy will work a thousand years to buy one of the coins that I got very early. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very self-serving narrative. It's a very rentier mentality. But in reality, the dude is just going to buy some Solana meme coin and make them, <laughs> right? He's going to be like, yeah. no, I'll pass. And every cycle though, this happens. So that's why, you know, last cycle was a very big coin, like maxi cycle in 2019. And then like basically the Bitcoin maxi thing didn't happen at all. Do Dominance went quite low. And then this cycle, like most natives were very over positioned on ETH and then like ETH DeFi. And then that's like not happening, right? Not, and then Solana, which is like became the, the people's coin after the Alameda uh, dump, then shock, like kind of shocked everyone. And like, like even BNB, like literally no one talks about BNB on CT, but there's like a hundred percent yield on L launch pad and on the launch pool. And it's like very close to all time highs. Uh, whereas like most coins are not like even thought is not as close to all time highs as BNB, as BNB is. So it's just this thing where, um, you have to go and look at what people are actually doing. And the only way to do that without having any framework is ask young people because they don't have your framework. So they won't see it from that point of view. They won't put it in an analogy or a category or they'll just say, okay, we're all buying these coins now because of this. And that's how we're thinking about it. So you get to play the game on its own. Uh, I, I remember in the beginning of DeFi somewhere, people were like, oh, this has already been tried before. Like uh, it, it won't work. It'll be hacks. Or like there, there's no volume, like there's no usability. And uh, I think what they miss is that it's a new game, right? New games, people don't know the rules. So you can't ask the old game players to learn the new game usually, especially if they have money. The, like the wealthier they are, the less likely they are to learn new things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in 2020, I think the the Bitcoin maxi narrative was, oh yeah, everyone's going to buy my bags. And now the narrative, I guess last year was, oh, 
you know, eat, like everyone's going to buy my eat bags, but like that doesn't happen. And maybe next cycle, uh, everyone's going to say they're going to buy my Solana bags, but no, that's not going to happen. Um, it's really hard to predict these narratives um, and narratives happen because no one really expects it. Right. And speaking of narratives, what do you think will be the biggest narratives this cycle? Um, is it going to be things like AI? Uh, can DeFi bounce back after the whole SEC Uniswap fiasco? Um, or is it going to be something totally out of left field that even we're not even aware of? Uh, what types of things do you think can bring new games this cycle? Uh, it's a good question. I think I'm still not convinced on AI. Like I've, I've studied BitTensor. I think it's okay. I mean, it has community. I have a ex defiance analyst that, uh, he's, he's working on it. Like he's building a project on it. So I, I see people building on it. Like a lot of my friends are, are Tau whales. So I can see that going, going up and doing well. I, I think AI is cool too, because anything can be AI. But at the same time, that's also bearish because it's just very dilution effect. Like essentially, let's say you say your AI with your coin doesn't pump, but then AI is pumping. Then is it AI? It's like a, it's like a tree falls in the forest, right? But no one hears it. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, ultimately, there's no definition of what is an AI coin. And the AI coins that have been around, let's say there was an AI rally late 2023, right? Where like, you know, Fetch and these kind of coins did big moves. Um, I don't think we're going to get that again because you kind of need like a cabal like rally on these coins to to justify that. But I think um you know, Tao is an interesting one because you know, it it got some hate from like an an Eric Wall type, which is always kind of bullish because it's like a bullish hate <laughs> into a community. But he's the kind of guy who like fud hex before the 100x, right? He's the kind of guy who would fud like link before right, the 50x. Right. Uh so like, actually, I got interested in Tau specifically because of the FUD, because I was like, okay, this sounds bullish. It's kind of like when I FUDed Rune, and then Rune went to six cents, and then, and then went to $20. So, yeah, it's a bullish FUD. FUD is always bullish, uh, almost. I don't think there's anything I would put my, I would like, you know, say this is going to be a narrative. I think Ox, obviously, will, will be a huge narrative uh, this year. Uh, because Ox ultimately is a, uh, I mean, it's both like a social token as well as now we have a product behind it. Uh, and also, you know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a 3AC Ether Rocks, thinking about it that way. It's like owned by like, owned by like 3AC Alliance Whales and has had a big flush out from the highs and gets himself going. I think like you, you want to look for these idiosyncratic coins in general. Stuff that can go 100x and people will be like, have to buy after 10x already. Like, you don't want to buy something where after 10x's, you already know who's going to sell and like why they're going to sell. Uh, I think that that's been the problem with a lot of CCT coins because it's like, once the CCT coin is almost like the top. Like, last year, there was a moment in time, like kind of frozen in time, when like every influencer started to shill Ox. And it was like, basically, as it was going up, people started pretending they owned it and, and, and everything. And then that turned out to be the top of Ox uh, at eight cent, but like, I think find something that you really like. I, I would love to ask you what the next narrative is actually, because I mean, you would know you're younger than me, so you should know, and I should be asking you. Uh, but um, I, I okay, so I think that uh, points trading, like wallet trading, could be interesting, right? Like if you can right now, Wales market, you're collateralizing points trading, but what if you can just trade wallets? Like you can, uh, so I have a friend who, who, who built that. So you can basically buy and sell the wallet itself. Uh, and I think that then you can borrow against the wallet. So when you, so you could, for instance, farm a bunch of points in a wallet and then you could sell it, um, to build that tech on, on EVM. Uh, not really a narrative, but it's some, something where I think that enables some interesting behaviors. Uh, it could actually bring about the end of the points, uh, um, so where like for, I mean, for instance, let, let's say on a hyper liquid, you are licked, but then you have like points still, but you need that, you want that money to be, to then trade with, but you don't have any collateral to like short points with. Right. There's a way you can transfer that, that kind of tech. That would be really interesting. I don't know.
yeah, it's I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 really hard. Like, I mean, even if you ask me, I don't even know what the narrative is. I mean, I think you know, AI, of course, will be a big narrative, but you know, if everyone tries to be an AI coin, then you know, everything is diluted, and maybe only a few coins pump. Um, I thought real world assets are going to be huge, um, and you know, mm-hmm. we have you know Larry Fink shilling it and whatnot, uh, but I don't think. Yeah, like RWAs have less of fundamentals, and people really care about the fundamentals. Yeah, they have very little fundamentals, and also the yields are too high on non uh, on crypto assets versus RWA assets. Yeah. So, I don't know if that's gonna work. Like, I I do know a project they're doing like decentralized Airbnb, kind of interesting, where the company has no tokens, but then the hosts and the guests they farm tokens, uh, by by you know renting out their place. So, you know, if that gets a lot of people actually, um, you know, like ultimately the thesis there is that the host, the super host, especially on Airbnb, they're the ones who actually have the, uh, that ha- have the trust, right? Like, like if you're, if you're someone who wants to rent a place, if you know that that guy has a listing on Airbnb as a super host, you don't need to rent it from Airbnb. You can just rent it from that guy himself, right? So if that guy were to put his property on like a Web3 platform, and then both sides are earning tokens. Now you're just like saving tons of money, especially even get like staying for free, right? Yeah. So you know See, stuff like you, this, I kind of think is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what, what are you talking about this? I, you know, there's there's this you know app called Blackbird. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's basically a loyalty program for restaurants using crypto tokens. And I've I've been eating, I've been eating to earn, for the past six months. Um, I think I gained a few pounds, but I think it's kind of interesting where, you know, when it comes to other like previous loyalty points, um, they ha- kind of have to give people like cash or like, I guess, rewards up front. But if you're a crypto yeah. company, you can just hand out points and tokens that are illiquid. And then once yeah. you're doing so, you get the crypto natives to farm across the board, yeah. you onboard more restaurants, and then something that connects yeah. the real world to crypto, I guess, consumer apps, I think sure. would be pretty big. For sure. Um, yeah, I'm pretty bullish on con- con- apps in general. Yeah, yeah. Th- there's a co- an- another co- company I saw where it's they're gonna try to be the crypto.com of the cycle, where you know the cards are very easy to use, they're usable everywhere, and you can load from a cold storage wallet, which you can't do right now on pretty much any wallet. So you know there's reg arb there that you need to be able to do that. But you know people forget, but like the Monaco token went like 100x. So if you had a card. And you just like spend money. You got you made like a million bucks if you got the best card, basically, because the coin went up so much. And that's like uh, we haven't quite seen that yet, where like a, like a B two C product uh, with a token makes its consumers rich. Uh, yeah, but that will certainly happen. But that will certainly happen, and that's part- partially why I think it's quite early in the cycle. Still, I think right now it's still natives playing money games and GBTC and and the, you know Bitcoin ETF inflows. Um, like we could very well be in for a very exhausting like five year cycle where it's just like slower paced on that basis. But um, let's see. Yeah. All right. Well, the, the next question I have is, you know, like, what are some trading and investing rules that you live by? Uh, where, yeah, it's just general rules you live by. Um, if you can share your wisdom that you've accumulated in the past, let's say, you know, six, five to 10 years, uh, I think our audience would love that. Uh, I think the biggest is to try to ask yourself, what is like, why might I be wrong? And try to write those down and look at them every day. Paul Tudor Jones had a fantastic quote that, you know, I should have done more of and all traders should do more of, which is that every day you mark your book at the last price. You don't, you don't ever, you don't ever think like, oh, I wish I sold higher or wish this or that. You just say, why am I owning it at the today's price? Not at yesterday's price, not at the price you bought it, but today's price. Um, Having that humility and that discipline is really important. Uh, I think also, you know, being really open-minded, uh, stay open-minded, know that like, you know, I had the tweet which went viral, which is like, you know, uh, don't focus on the bags that you fumbled in the past. The ones you're fumbling now are just as big, if not bigger. Right. And it's, uh, yeah, every OG will tell you that it's literally true. But then a lot of like, not like just newer people in crypto, they're like, no, 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 I fumbled so hard already. I'll never make it back. And it's like, no. Watch as you fumble yet more bags every day, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, because when you've been around a lot long enough, you would have fumbled like ETH ICO, 
EOS ICO, Tron ICO, BNB ICO. I mean, I, I can go on. I can list a hundred fumbles that you could have made, all of which could have made you like uh, eight figures, right? Yeah. I can name you more fumbles than you probably even know trades that could have made money, like that, that like big <laughs> yeah. money. So that's like the thing that, I mean, it, it, it requires you to be full-time in crypto to be like having that perspective. And most people are not full-time in crypto, right? So they're going to be like, you know, if they somehow manage to, let's say, buy Olympus at like very, very early days and they fumble that, it's going to feel like, well, I'm never going to get it again because like, how did I even manage to do it? Maybe some friend told me, right? But for full-time, if, you're, if, you, can, if you commit to the game, if you commit to crypto, then yeah, it's like, that is very, very uh, common to like, there's just so many fumbles like we're doing right now even like you, you know just to have like a podcast you're already fumbling i know bags somewhere right that's why we got to end it soon it's just fumble nonstop. but no it's like <laughs> it's just literally it's, it's incredibly difficult to to overstate how fast moving the market is i mean think about bomi right bomi went from zero to like listen yeah. on binance within like a day and a half uh, so if you were just like taking a flight, you like missed the whole thing, which is not to make you follow everything, but it's to make you realize that like, uh, not to stress too hard over what you fumbled before next time, try to have a framework to not fumble it, but you know, cycles are extremely, extremely powerful at, at wealth creation and wealth destruction. So, uh, respecting that requires basically having that framework of saying, Continue to be hungry, continue to learn. Got it. Just curious, like, how do you, this is an audience question uh, that I'll just pull up real quick. Do you even use TA when it comes to trading or like, yeah, like what, what's your view on TA? Uh, do you think it's useful? Um, do you think it's just? TA is definitely useful. I think order, order book flow is useful. It is also astrology for men, but astrology is also useful. So I think it's, um, it's kind of a mix of the, yeah, it's like the masculine feminine. TA is masculine astrology, you know. Uh, but because people all look at it, then they care. It's like astrology also works because people will be like, I am this, so I behave like this. So then right. if everyone believes it, then, then, then they will actually start to self-fulfill the prophecy, you know. Got it. And if you, read your astro- if, you, if you read your astrology like every week, like to, to predict that then you will actually do the things that it tells you to do. It's all because it, the line between like advice and prediction is a non-duality. The, there's no difference, right? If someone gives you advice and they also pr- predict things for you, like where does the line end? So same with TA, like does the market fall TA? Does TA work? Like the market knows what TA is. So it, TA is a part of the market, right? Got it. Yeah. Well, anyways, we're like an hour and a half in. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, we are fumbling bags. Yeah, like we're fumbling bags right now, but I think, you know, uh, our audience will enjoy it. Uh, yeah. All good, all good. Yeah. Cool. Do you, so, so th- just to wrap things up, uh, do you have any final words of advice or wisdom that you want to share with our audience? You know, we're all retail, um, trying to make it. Uh, just what advice would you have for the average person out there that's grinding in the trenches? Yeah, I think join discords, don't join telegrams, make sure you find smart people to, to talk stuff with, uh, stay positive, try to, you know, try to keep your job while you do crypto, if you can, so that you can feed that like loop when you have a solid base, then you can consider going full time, but don't, don't, uh, do it too early as well. So, yeah, sorry, just one final question. Um, I think this is something a lot of people don't talk about because of, I guess, the masculinity of crypto, which t- uh, tends to be a lot of like, like male dominated. But I think if you view cri- uh, crypto as a sport, um, even in sports right now, we have athletes coming out with just being more vulnerable with their mental health problems, uh, like Richarlison with Brazil and whatnot. Like, how, how do you, you know, manage your mental health? Because I'm sure, you know, you've had wild swings and it's really, really hard. Or it's really easy to be hard on yourself to say, like, you know, like, I, I can't do it again. Or, you know, like, h- how do you keep your positivity? H- how, how do you keep your mental uh, health sh- uh, sharp, your, h- h- like your, your mental edge? Um, I think one of the most important, I think one of the most important is to be 
be really grateful for the opportunities you have, right? Like you, you're in such a rarefied position, even to be able to speculate or to be able to trade or invest. So be grateful. Like every day when you wake up in the morning, be grateful for a lot of things and be genuinely grateful and not, you know, you may start doing it as an affirmation, but later on you may realize, wait, I am actually genuinely grateful. For instance, you have all your limbs, you have all your eyes, you have your, you have your faculties about you, right? That you have an education. You know, there's, there, there, there's people in refugee camps that have no food. There's people that have no ability to ever even climb like anything. So I think, you know, that's one of those things that like, you know, Chinese parents will tell you when you're a kid and it's like, you know, eat, finish your rice because, uh, right, right, right. you know, they're just kids are in Africa and you think it's stupid, but actually you're like, your parents are Lindy there. You should learn that, right? You should learn that. In fact, there are kids with no rice. So eat your rice. And be appreciative that you have rice, you know, and that's in, in the, in the, in the Judeo-Christian context, it's like, you know, like you say your grace before you eat a meal. Right. And the idea there is that, well, you could not have food for instance, and then you'd be a lot hungrier. So it's a blessing that you have that. So count, count, counting your blessings is really key because that's part of also how you assess your faculties and, and you assess your, uh, how you might do, uh, you know, a, a recovery or how, how you might do something new. So, uh, know that like you have free will basically. Um, and if your life is a movie or if your life is a, is a story, uh, know that then everything happens for a reason in the sense that you, for instance, may have done something that's very lucky and good for you now, but that actually is unlucky in the future. Whereas something that feels unlucky now can be very lucky in the future. Um, mm -hmm. I've witnessed that many times in my own life where, you know, if you don't, you think this is very bad for you, actually it's very, very good for you within just a couple of years. And something that you think is very good for you is then very, very bad for you. So, you know, the ability of the human mind to at any moment actually know what is good or bad for you is very, very hard to, uh, is, is a, so having that humility to say, I don't actually even know what is that good or bad for you at any moment. You, you have to take that perspective and say, you know, some of the biggest firms are started by people who failed twice. I, I mean, CZ failed four times before he started Binance. Right. So it's something where uh, having that experience and having that always learning mentality uh, can come naturally to you when you start being grateful uh, for what you have. So, yeah. And even with like the whole market wizards books, uh, most traders interviewed, yeah. they're just blow up once, you know, they make a bunch of money. They feel they have an ego, then they blow up and then yeah, they hate themselves, for sure. but they just keep going. Um, anyways, yeah, th thank you, Sue, uh, for your time. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think our audience will Ooh. get a lot from this. Awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. Any any final right. words? Uh, all good, all good. We, yeah. All right. Thanks for having awesome. me. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thank you.